Oh, I'd like to welcome you tonight where we're going to discover the science of sleep. And if we look at our sustain me principles, we see that number three is sleep. And God designed us to sleep in the night hours. And sleep was never an issue before the electric light. Did you know that? It's never been an issue before. But what's happening with the electric light, and it certainly is happening even more with one step forward with, with technology, is people are being kept awake when they should be asleep. It's such a distraction and it's such an attraction. But what people don't realise is what it's doing inside their brain. So I'd like to have a look at what happens when we sleep. There's a little tiny gland in the base of our brain called the pineal gland. And the pineal gland sits right at the back of our brain and it releases four hormones every night. At the moment in summertime, it's between 10 and 3. And in the winter time, it's between 9 and 2. So how come the hormones are only released in that time? Well, light and dark signals are fed through the optic nerve to a control centre in the brain where our, our body clock is located. And our body clock communicates with our pineal gland. What are these hormones? One hormone is serotonin, and serotonin is the mood hormone. So if you want to feel good, go to bed early. And we know when the children have late nights, they're not happy chappies, are they? Another hormone is melatonin, and melatonin is called the fix and rejuvenate nighttime hormone. So it's in those hours that healing accelerates. It's in those hours where our bodies recharge, revive. Also, arginine vasotocin. And arginine vasotocin is a hormone that puts us into a deep sleep. So if you want to go into a deep sleep, the earlier you go to bed, the more likely you are to go into a deep sleep. But arginine vasotocin is something else. It's our natural painkiller. Did you know that God gave us our own natural painkiller? So when we go to bed early, our natural painkiller kicks in. But when we use our natural painkiller, it releases a waste after being used. And if that waste still is around the next night, arginine vasotocin is not released. So how do we cause a release of the waste from using arginine vasotocin? Let's move on through our basic laws of health with trust in, the God, in God right in the middle. And we will get to one of the laws that allows the waste to be released out of the body. We have to get down further to get to this law. It's actually the last law, if you remember it, which is exercise. So when we exercise, we cause a release of uh, perspiration, which we automatically do when we're moving the body. And as that perspiration is released, it releases the waste from using arginine vasotocin. I have a girlfriend who was a nurse. Now, back in the 80s and 90s, nurses used to do all the lifting. And a lot of nurses got very sore backs, <laughs> painful backs. Today, they have strong men to do the lifting, or in some hospitals, they have like little cranes to, to lift the people. But a lot of nurses in the 80s and 90s had to retire from nursing because of bad backs. Do you know the biggest bone in the whole of our body is our femur? And the biggest muscle mass in the whole of our body are our quads, which is our, our um, thigh muscles. And God made it that way so that we do all our lifting and bending here. Did you realise that? So when we bend and lift, it should be using our, using our strongest muscle. And we can only use it if our back remains straight. If we bend or lift like that, all the strain goes on our lower back. But if we bend and lift like this, all the strain goes here. Remember that. <laughs> it's time to protect 
protect our backs. But my girlfriend, she had a quite a major in, injury. She had it um, surgery. Then she was put on painkillers and and basically retired at a very young age. You know, she's only in her forties. But what's she going to do now? What, what's the future? Being on painkillers for the rest of your life, it's not good because after a while the painkillers actually don't do what they used to do. And then a speaker came to the town that spoke on natural pain management and he spoke about arginine vasitocin, our natural painkiller that God put in our brain that gets released every night. But he also talked about the importance of exercise. And so he advocated walking for five hours a day, sorry, five kilometres a day. <laughs> What's that? Now, I quickly worked this out when I was in Rocky Mountains National Park last Saturday afternoon. And when I saw the two to Emerald Lake, I thought two kilometres, no, it was two miles, which is twice as far. <laughs> So I guess five kilometres would be almost ten. And it took her an hour and little by little, as the weeks went by, her pain levels got less and less and she was able to come off her pain medication. She had to do two things. She had to exercise every day and she had to um, go to bed early at night. Because if you go to bed late, of course, you can't access your arginine vasitocin. Something else happened as she exercised. Her muscles and her ligaments and her tendons that are around her injury became strong and they compensated for the injury. Isn't that interesting? And she also found, and I, I was looking at this in detail recently, that as the muscles and the tendons and the ligaments around the spine are starting to work, more blood's going into that area and that blood supply that sits around the bones nourishes the bone and the bone can actually recover and heal. Isn't that incredible? What an amazing body we have. That's why exercise certainly last but not least in the basic laws of health. The fourth hormone is called epithalamin. An epithalamin is a hormone that increases learning capacity. So it's important to go to bed early every night to access your epithalamin, which increases your learning capacity. And as you'll find out over the next couple of days where we talk on the mind, our brain should be getting younger as we get older, and part of that is learning something new every single day. So to allow you to be, able, to be able to retain and learn th new things every day, we need to be going to bed early to, to get our epithalamin levels. What I found fascinating was adhering to these laws boosts the release of those hormones from our pineal gland every night. Sunshine in the day, remember that initial statement? Light and dark signals are fed through the optic nerve to a control centre in the brain where your body clock is located. Sunshine in the day increases the output of these hormones at night and sleeping in the dark. <laughs> when that sun goes down, our body knows it, even if the lights are on inside. And everything starts to slow down when that sun goes down. Water, those hormones need us to be well hydrated to be able to make those hormones. Yes, sleep, go to bed early. Stress inhibits the output of those hormones. Trust in God, cast all your care upon him, says 1 Peter 5, 7, for he cares for you. And in Psalm 55, verse 22, the Bible says, Cast thy burden upon the Lord, and he shall sustain thee. He will never suffer the righteous to be moved. Abstain from all stimulants. What the research shows now is that coffee in the day cuts the output of those hormones in half for five hours. Alcohol inhibits the output by up to 40%. So the stimulants interfere with the output of the hormones at night. Our brain is made up of nerve cells. The pineal gland also has cells that function in there that require oxygen. And we get more oxygen if we inhale and exhale always through the nose. 
the very part of the body where God breathed the breath of life into man. Nutrition, nourishing food. We've been looking at the food, the fruits, the vegetables, the nuts, the seeds, the whole grains and also the legumes. They provide all the nutrition necessary to make those hormones. Moderation, don't overdo it. When people eat their largest meal at night, it inhibits the output of those hormones at night because so much energy is required to digestion. See, when we go to sleep at night, our stomach wants to sleep too. That's why we should be eating most of our food at breakfast and lunch, our two main meals. It was probably in the 1950s that research was done to look at more about sleep. And what they discovered because they first of all did it on rats and they found there were times when the rat's eyes moved very, very fast and they had electrodes on the brain and they found when the eyes moved, the brain was moving faster. And then there were periods of time where the eyes were still and then the brain was a lot more, was a lot slower in its activity. And they called the eye, rapid eye movement time basically rapid eye movement. And they, caused, they called the busy time non... Sorry, that's the rapid eye, but the non-busy time they called rapid eye movement. And they discovered certain things are happening in those times. In rapid eye movement time, this is where a filing system happens. So here's our brain. And from tomorrow night and also on Saturday, we'll be looking at the brain. And the top part of the brain is called the cortex. And right at the back here, there's a little gland called the hippocampus. And the hippocampus is where our short-term memory, all through the day, everything that happens through the day is stored in the hippocampus, called our short-term memory unit. And in rapid eye movement time, there's a filing system because in non-rapid eye movement time, there's a courier service. And what the courier service does is it takes those memories up to the top of the cortex and stores them there. And as it stores them, there's a filing system. It's not stored in any, any haphazard way. In fact, in the book, Why We Sleep, Dr. Matthew Walker, he's, a, he's an atheist, and he said in his book, it's almost as if sleep has an intelligence. And if I was to talk to him, I'd say, that's right, mate. <laughs> it's God. God designed this incredible body with an inbuilt ability to heal. Even, even order in the filing system, and I'm sure we know the account of when Jesus died and rose again, when they went into the grave, all the grave clothes were neatly folded. He is a God of order. And we see that incredible order all through nature, all through the human body. You might have heard the saying, it's a saying in neuroscience, nerves that lie together, fire together. And what I mean by that is, is all our positive memories are filed together. All our negative memories are filed together. Have you noticed when you're feeling sad or discouraged, all the discouragements come up? That's because the nerves that lie together fire together. But have you noticed on a wonderful day when everything's going perfectly well, everything's good? That's because the nerves that lie together fire together. And what they've discovered is this filing system happens in a, perf in a certain order. Something else is happening in rapid eye movement time, and that is dreaming. There's been lots of theories about dreams. I studied as a psychiatric nurse in my early 20s and we studied Sigmund Freud and he had theories about dreams. And the Bible certainly speaks about how God talks to man through dreams, there's no doubt about that. But it seems that dreaming every night has a purpose. Some people have said to me, but I don't dream. I said, you actually do. But the only time you remember your dream is when you wake up in the middle of your dream. But every night, our dreams come up and it appears that these dreams are helping to know how to file 
the memories of the day. What also happens in rapid eye movement time, there's a consolidation of the things we learnt through the day. So it's not just enough to uh, understand and remember, but we want it consolidated in our brain. And so in rapid eye movement time, that is happening. Also, in rapid eye movement time, this is when all the inventions come to our minds. I am the daughter of an inventor. <laughs> I am the sister of an inventor. My father and my brother are the inventors. And what the research is showing is that in those early hours, because as you'll see, that's when rapid eye movement, rapid eye movement time is the busiest. It's in those early hours of the morning. Did you know that God has an appointment with every human being in the early hours of the morning? You'll find it in, in Isaiah chapter 50, verse 4. The Bible says, The Lord God hath given me the tongue of the learned, that I may know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. He wakeneth morning by morning. He wakeneth my ear to hear as the learned. It's those early hours of the morning where those incredible inventions come into the mind of man and woman. So what's happening in non-rapid eye movement time? There's a courier service that takes the day's memories up to the long-term storage unit, but there's also a cleaning system. It appears in non-rapid eye movement time that the cells shrink up, allowing more fluid between the brain cells it's almost similar to what happens in the city streets at night. You know, in the city streets at night, the street cleaners come along. Well, that's happening in our brain at night. It seems that the cells shrink up, allowing more fluid between the cells, and the glymphatic system is stimulated. The glymphatic system is a system that uses glial cells, and there are more glial cells in our brain than nerve, the nerve cells. And this glymphatic system, it cleans up waste from neuronal activity. It cleans up waste from the combustion of oxygen and glucose in the cell. It also has the ability to clean up uh, negative memories. Isn't that good news? And we'll talk about that a little bit more when we look at um, the healing of the mind as we go through our Saturday lectures. What they found is that these two periods happen in 90-minute intervals. What Dr. Matthew found after many years of research and actually looking at many more years of research, that the brain needs eight hours a night. Now, he was not happy with this conclusion because it's not a conclusion that he wanted to come to, but eight hours. So that can be... 8 p.m. to 4 a.m. It could be 9 p.m. to 5 a.m. That's probably my favourite. Or it could be at a stretch in the summer. It could be 10 to 6. So God always gives us a choice, and there's our choices. I'd like to show you how these work in the night hours. So non-rapid eye movement time and rapid eye movement time, because there are different parts of the night where these are more active. So let's do the 9 to 5. So 9 to 10.30, that's our first 90 minute. Non-rapid eye movement time or activity takes up 80% of the time, whereas rapid eye movement only takes up 20% of the time. So our next 90 minute is between 10.30 and 12 midnight. 60% rapid eye movement non-rapid eye movement in that time and 40% rapid eye movement. So between 12 and 1.30 a.m., it's about 50-50. 50, 50. 50 rapid and 50 non-rapid eye movement time. So we move on and now we're up to 1.30 to 3 a.m. And it's 40% non-rapid eye movement time and 60% rapid eye movement time. And that brings us to the last two hours, three to five, 
and that's 20% non-rapid eye movement time and 80% rapid eye movement time. This explains so much. If a person goes to bed at midnight, they can wake up in the morning and there still can be some memories in the short-term memory unit so that through the day they won't be able to take in as much of their memory. And if a person goes to bed at midnight, they've actually lost out on some of their cleaning system. And as you'll find out tomorrow night when we look at Alzheimer's, missing out on that cleaning system means little amyloid calcified plaques can build up in the brain. And I don't know anyone that wants to get Alzheimer's. And there is a reason. Proverbs 26 verse 2 states that the curse causeless shall not come. Alzheimer's should not be happening. And often there are many causes, as we'll see tomorrow night. But one of them, a big contributing factor, is lack of sleep. We need to be going to bed to access not only pineal gland activity, but also these systems that happen every night. When we have our full eight hours, it allows for these two systems that God put in the brain for rest, recharge, for cleaning, for, for movement, from our memories to different places, for dreaming, for filing, for inventions. All of that God designed to happen in our sleeping hours. What Dr. Matthew Walker found, and he did a lot of research on this, he got 20 students. 10 of them had six hours a night, 10 of them had eight hours a night, and they all learnt the same thing. And at the end of three months, the ones that were on eight hours sleep a night, it was all in a university, they were all students, they retained 30, sometimes 40% more than the ones that had six hours sleep a night. So Oxford University asked him to do a paper on good study habits for Oxford University. And he talked about this. He talked about the importance of going to bed early, that best study time happens early in the morning. Go to bed at 8 and get up at 4 a.m. In fact, those two hours from 4 to 6, the person can learn almost twice as much and retain twice as much as uh, 10 to midnight when the person's falling asleep. He also talked about the danger of having stimulants. He talked about the importance of exercise, about the importance of nourishing food. And he also talked about the importance of not having so many exams altogether. He talked about having one and then a few days break and then another one to allow the students to revive. Well, they never asked him to write a paper again but actually what he wrote was the truth. There's a great deceiver out there who will deceive us as much as possible into missing out on these valuable hours where these process, processes take, take place in the night. Michael and I have been married 25 years and when we married, he was a night owl. <laughs> he had two children, he was a single father. He used to put his children to bed and then he'd go to the office till one o'clock in the morning. He said, no one rings me at one o'clock in the morning. I can get so much done. So when we married, at 8.30 at night, I'd say, but I have claims. <laughs> I have claims to have time with you in the evening. He said, okay. And about every two weeks, he'd say, I just got to do it. I'm behind. And so he would, he would stay up till 1 a.m., but what he found was his next day was wiped out. And what he does now, in fact, he, he never has a late night. He discovered that no one rings you at 4 or 5 a.m., have you noticed? <laughs> Unless they're ringing from the other side of the world. <laughs> and you can get so much more done in those early hours of the morning. So even though I married a night owl, he is no longer a night owl. <laughs> he discovered a far better way. You might have heard the old saying that says, an hour before midnight is worth two hours after midnight. It's an old saying, and yet 
The research now proves why that is so. And there's another old saying, early to bed, early to rise, makes a man healthy, wealthy and wise. And it, it, it is true. What, what Dr. Matthew Walker showed was that 10 nights of six hours sleep a night, 50% cognitive performance, 50% less physical performance. You see, the six hours is a, is a total deception because you feel okay. Four hours, you have four hours sleep, you, you feel like it. <laughs> but six hours, you actually, you actually feel okay. But he showed you are not okay. It's, it's a great deception. So I used to, you know, when I turned 50, I started to sleep a bit less and I used to say to people, I only need six hours of sleep a night since I turned 60 and then in my mid-60s I read the book Why We Sleep and I thought, oh, <laughs> I need to sleep. I need to sleep because of what I want out of my day and out of my life. So how did I train myself back into sleep? You see, my problem was I would wake up early and the chat room would start. You familiar with the chat room? Now I'm going to do this and I'll go over here and I'll do it like that, da, 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 chat, 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 chat. I had to get out of that chat room because if you get into the chat room, you're never going to sleep. So how do we get out of the chat room? Do you know there's lots of tips on how you can get out of the chat room? And how I get out of the chat room is I go through the verses that I've memorised. Probably the longest I've memorised is James chapter 1, it's 27 verses. And in the morning, I think, where did I get to? I think I got to verse 13 <laughs> because I got out of the chat room. you just got to get out of that chat room. And the old saying is to count sheep jumping over a fence, uh, count, to a hun count from a hundred backwards. One lady told me that she, re she pictures someone in her life who she was very fond of when she was young. Maybe it's a great aunt. Maybe it's... Maybe it's a neighbour that she used to stay with. Maybe it's, uh, you know, whatever it is. I think my husband would picture helicopters because he's a helicopter pilot and he owned his own helicopter for a year. His mother had died allowing a little bit of money to buy a helicopter. It was a very expensive toy. <laughs> Within one year, you've just about got to replace the whole helicopter. And we are a ministry with houses to renovate. But he had it for a year. He used to tell me that he dreams a lot about helicopters. <laughs> so it's just something that you love, something that will take your mind out of the chat room. My son James, he said, this is what I do. I lie there and I say, don't think, don't think, don't think, don't think, don't think. I told one man about that and he said, it works. <laughs> don't think, don't think, don't think. So it's... It's whatever. Now, there's another very good one, and this is found in 1 Thessalonians 5.18, where the Bible says, in everything give thanks. Just to lie there and list all the things that you're thankful for. Thank, thank you, Father in heaven, that I'm wide awake because now I can talk to you. <laughs> thank you. It's called, actually, cognitive behavioural therapy, which means if you say it's good, it will be, and if you say it's bad, it's... It will be. So some of the things that can stop you sleeping is getting into that chat room. You've just got to find a way to get out of the chat room. One lady said she puts a soft light on and reads a boring book. <laughs> the Life Habits of the Australian Platypus, maybe. <laughs> Something that's not terribly exciting. And she said when, when, when the book falls out of her hand, she quickly turns the light off and puts it down. But what will, what will stop you sleeping is certainly the chat room and also getting annoyed with the fact that you can't sleep. You will never go to sleep if you get annoyed with the fact that you can't sleep. Have you noticed? That's why you've got to flip out of that and lie there and be thankful. Thank you so much, Father. I'm in a comfortable bed. Thank you so much. I'm not in a Siberian work camp with newspaper for my blanket. Just be incredibly thankful for what you have because there's so much we have to be thankful for. If you don't 
can't think of anything to be thankful for. It's time to go and work in an orphanage in India or Africa for six months. You will be so very thankful for what you have. And you know what I find? I saw this in my, my friend's orphanage in Nakuru, Kenya. Those children are so happy. They're so happy. I said to one, do you like it here? I do. I've got a bed. They've never had a bed. They haven't got a pillow. They can't afford pillows, actually. But they've got a bed. <laughs> Have you got a bed? That's something to be incredibly thankful for. What will also guarantee stop sleep is looking at your phone. And 80% of Americans sleep with their phones. And the pillow is no protection against those electromagnetic fields. So the phone must be far away from you. And if you need it, for a, need it for an alarm clock, put it in the hallway. I can promise you, you'll wake up. <laughs> so get that technology out of the bedroom to ensure that you sleep well. It's important to have the window open. I'm in a hotel at the moment, and unfortunately, I can only open it one inch. There are blocks on it. <laughs> but at night, I usually have my windows open wide. Also, make sure that you're sleeping in natural fibre. Did you know that those chemical fabrics, those fabrics like polyester, nylon and acrylic, did you know they interfere with your electromagnetic field? Have you noticed they give off static sometimes? So it's important to sleep in natural fibre, whether that be linen or whether that be cotton or whether it may be one of the new natural fabrics made out of wood, viscose or rayon or modal, but make sure you're sleeping in natural fibre. Make sure your sleeps, what the sheets in your bread are made out of natural fibre because that does interfere with the air. It interferes with your, your whole body's mechanisms. Make sure that your, your bedding is aired in the sunshine regularly. Your blankets, your quilts. Have you noticed when you buy a pillow today, it's got a date on it? Oh, I don't know about it, but in Australia you buy a pillow that's got a date on it because we lose a lot of moisture while we sleep and especially if you perspire a little bit then the moisture goes into the pillow and if that doesn't get a good sun and air, can you see mould can build up in, in that pillow? So it's important that, the, that all of our bedding is clean and, and is made out of natural fibre. Also look at the, the environment where you sleep. If you've got carpet in your bedroom, that must be vacuumed at least once a week. That bed should be pulled out. So make sure that the air in your breathing, breathing that you're breathing while you sleep is the purest of air. Now some people choose to sleep with a little bit of tape over their mouth. Not like this, just a little bit of tape to encourage nose breathing. And that's one of the best ways to stop snoring and also to conquer sleep apnea. Now, just a little bit there, so at a stretch, you can open a little bit of your mouth. But a way to get used to that is to put a little bit of tape on your mouth for maybe an hour a day, for four or five days, before you decide to sleep with it all night. Because remember what breathing through your nose does, it purifies the air, it warms the air, it humidifies the air, it pressurises the air, it balances the blood gases. And I'm just telling you the main ones, there's a whole lot of other little bits and pieces it does. So make sure your nose breathing at night, if you're not sure, you can try that little bit of tape. Also important that when you go to sleep that, you've, that your stomach is empty. When we sleep at night, our stomach wants to sleep as well. What if you only have five hours a night? What if you only have four hours a night? What can you do to get to eight hours a night? Well, remember Rome wasn't built in a day. It won't happen quickly, but you can train yourself back into sleeping longer and longer and longer. It's important to go to bed early, to access those hours of power 
And remember getting out of the chat room, making sure the technology is not in the room. But there are a few things that people have found are very helpful when they have trouble sleeping. For some people this makes a difference, for some people it doesn't make a difference. Remember you're the doctor, so try them and see what works for you. One is valerian. I think that's an E. Valerian is a herb that is the, a mild tranquilizer, a mild sedative. And chamomile, chamomile is a very gentle one. Whereas the, and it's certainly more pleasant to drink. Valerian is not a pleasant drink. A lot of people choose to take valerian in a tablet or a um, capsule form. Some people find magnesium helps. Magnesium is a muscle relaxant. So the best magnesium is magnesium citrate. And it's usually 500 milligrams before you go to bed. What also can help is melatonin. Some people have found this helps, some people have found that it doesn't help. Remember you're the doctor there, what works for one may not work for another. But these are some of the things that people have found can help to relax them and get them back into the habit of sleeping every night. Because as you can see, it's very important. It's a very important law of health. And it's when our batteries are recharged and revived in the night hours. I'd like to open the floor now for any questions. If you have any questions on sleep. Hi, Miss Barbara. Um, is it all right to sleep uh, naked? It certainly is. Okay. It certainly is. Is that a good natural way to? It is. A lot of people find that uh, they sleep much better naked, and I guess um, Adam and Eve did. <laughs> okay. <laughs> just but it's a, it's certainly a personal choice. Thank you very much. Hi, good afternoon. Um, I have a question that's not directly related to sleep, but I notice um, on the presentations that you're not wearing glasses. So my question is, how can we prevent um, presbyopia or reverse maturing eyes? The, um, there is a very good book by Dr. William Bates. It's called Better Eyesight Without Glasses. And I have another book in my library at home and it's, um, it's called Help Your Children to Have Better Eyesight. And it's written by a lady who used to wear glasses as thick as Coke bottles. And she no longer wears glasses. And she wore those glasses from when she was a, um, about a teenager. And she read Dr. Matthew, Dr. William Bates' book, um, Better Eyesight Without Glasses, and she implemented the basic principles and in his last chapter of his book he basically lists the laws of health and he shows how the eyes need sunshine. Never should we look at the sun but being outside those ultraviolet rays are going through the eyes. He talked about how those eye cells need us to be well hydrated. He talked about the importance of eyes sleeping and he also showed that eye strain in the morning strengthens the eyes. But eye strain at night, when our brain is tired, weakens our eyes, because our eyes are an extension of our brain. I found that interesting. He also showed how stress can influence the quality of our eyesight. He also showed how the stimulants, they have a, such a dehydrating effect on the body that they can influence eyesight. 
oxygen. All those eye cells need, need oxygen and we get more oxygen when we breathe in and out through our nose. He also showed how the eye cells need nourishment, so we should be eating the most nourishing food. Don't overdo anything, <laughs> work or sleep or play. And daily exercise increases the circulation of the blood to the eyes. Rebounding can help. And how rebounding helps is, and I do this on my rebounder. See, we've got long and short range muscles in the eyes. So when you rebound, say I'll re be rebounding in my lounge room and I'll focus on the window pane and the tree in the background jumps. And after 10 jumps, I focus on the tree and then the window pane jumps. <laughs> And I've got some hanging pots and I'll focus on one of those and the, and the car behind it will jump but the flower will stay still. You, you get my point. You're constantly um, doing short range, short range. And <clears throat> one of the problems today is people do too much short range. One eye doctor said, we need to spend more time gazing at the mountains. We need to spend more time long, long range. Now, when I am do, looking at fine print, I do have some glasses that are slightly magnified, but use your glasses as little as possible. Hi, good evening. I have a three-part question, if you don't mind. Should we keep plants in our bedrooms? That's question number one. What type of plants? And how do plants help to purify the air to help us sleep better? Thank you. One of the best plants to purify the air is the um, spider plant. And it's because it's spider plant, it's so, the leaves are so numerous. And the spider plant basically has a leaf like that. And it's got white and green stripes, but it's so numerous, it's, it's like this. The, the leaves are so numerous, it makes a very nice um, potted plant. And what happens is the plants take in the carbon dioxide that we breathe out and give off oxygen. So plants do a great job at purifying the air. Um, there's a listener. She, the question is not about sleep, but she wants to find out if there's any hope for ulcers. For what? Ulcers. ulcers, yes, stomach ulcers. Certainly is certainly is. There's a herb called, there's two herbs that coat and soothe the lining of the gastrointestinal tract. One is called Slipriol and it's taking that with water and drinking it and it coats, soothes and heals the lining of the gut. So for stomach ulcer you could take that before every meal and just before bed. Take it before you go to sleep at night, it coats and soothes the lining. The other herb is aloe vera. <clears throat> 